In the last video, we introduced the vertebrata by discussing the earliest branches, which we generally refer to as the fishes. The last of those, the lobe fin fish, actually include the tetrapods, and the tetrapods are going to be broken up into two lectures. So we recently covered the lobe fin fishes, and within the clade that would actually include the sarcopterygians, which are the lobe fin fishes, would include the tetrapods. So we're going to be looking at the tetrapods starting today, and we're going to be looking at the amphibians, which are described here as the lysamphibia. This includes the salamanders, frogs, toads, Sicilians, and then we're going to talk about the remaining vertebrates which fit under the clade, the amniota. And here we have the amniota here. This includes the mammals and the reptiles. And reptiles, to be monophyletic, must include birds. So snapomorphies for tetrapods is the presence of four limbs with digits. That's how they get their names. Tetrapod means four appendages or four legs. Within the amniota, the synapomorphy that's key there is the presence of an amniotic egg, which is going to be really important in allowing them to break free of a requirement of water for reproduction. A synapomorphy for the mammals is the mammary glands themselves and hair. The reptilia, which is also referred to as the diapsida. The snapomorphies include beta keratin, which is used to, in the production of scales and feathers. And then, as the name implies for diapsida, a diapsid skull. We'll talk about skull morphology and the importance of that in terrestrial vertebrate evolution. So these are all triple blastic bilaterally symmetrical UC limates. And what we're going to see is kind of the theme of this lecture and the next is that the terrestrial environment has really produced several challenges. Gravity is simply a more impactful force than non-buoyant terrestrial habitats. So that's going to require the evolution of greater support systems. So we're going to see modifications in the skeleton and muscles. Sensory structures also work differently in air versus water because the different densities of and the ability to sense gravity is also going to uh, affect the balance, which isn't as important in water as it is in the terrestrial environment. The terrestrial environment also typically is dry, so organisms tend to evolve structures to minimize water loss. So integumental structures that prevent evaporation of water, digestive and excretory structures that use a minimum amount of water in their processing, and internalizing your respiratory structures instead of having gills. Gills wouldn't work hanging out in the environment. They would dry out too quickly. So you have to internalize your respiratory structures into lungs. And most of the tetrapods we'll see, those that are adapted best to the terrestrial environment, are restricted to copulation with internal fertilization. And we'll see that the use of a specific type of egg that doesn't require water to develop, the amniotic egg, is really important in the amniotes. There's also a big difference in how quickly temperatures can change in air versus water. So this is going to put a premium on the evolution of insulating epidermal structures, such as feathers in birds and hair in mammals. Another way to try to keep your temperature at its thermal optimum is to have behaviors that where you move from one microhabitat to the other that has the preferred temperatures. So we'll talk about this as behavioral homeothermy. But in some cases, we'll see that tetrapods simply just have to shut down all their activity when the environmental temperatures get either too hot or too cold, and that's when they go into hibernation or estivation. So many amphibians uh, must live in or near water or wet human environments. That's why they're called amphibians. They can live in the terrestrial environments, but they also have to be in water for some part of their life. Oftentimes, this is due to the fact that they rely on cutaneous respiration, and their skin has mucus glands that help keep their skin moist, and so it, it is able to maintain the functioning respiration. Remember, a respiratory surface as it dries out isn't going to work anymore. Now, the toads tend to live in drier habitats, and they have thicker and more keratinized skin to keep themselves from drying out, but they also don't use their skin as respiration. They use lungs instead. In general, amniotes have epithelial adaptations that allow them to better exist in arid habitats. So in general, they have thicker keratinized skin, 
But they also have other epithelial structures, including glands, the production of scales, feathers, and hair. And these have a, a variety of functions, including reduction of water loss across the epithelium. They provide uh, protection against rubbing or abrasion. They sometimes are used in communication or cryptic coloration by uh, coloring the body. And then feather and hair are really important in insulation. And we'll see that they're found in only mammals and birds, which are our primary groups that are showing endothermy. Feathers themselves are incredibly lightweight structures that grow from the epidermal follicle cells. And as I mentioned, birds are the only living animals that have feathers. However, I, I put living here as a specific point because there is clear evidence now that many of the extinct dinosaur lineages also had feathers. And this is the group from which birds are derived. A complete set of feathers is what we call a bird's plumage. And because feathers are non-living structures after they grow in, they eventually uh, fall apart and so they have to be replaced regularly. And this process is called molting. And that typically occurs twice a year in birds. The molt that does occur twice a year, usually you have kind of a dull plumage and another that is more brightly colored, particularly in males. And that brighter plumage is associated with the mating season. There are different feather types that serve different functions. So down in semi-plumes, this is down shown here, these are important for insulation and helping these endothermic animals retain this heat that they've worked so hard to generate. Contour feathers overlie the down feathers. They provide a nice streamlined body uh, for aerodynamics and also to help kind of form a seal and retain that heat where the, the down feathers are held underneath. They also have these hair-like feathers that are used for tactile uh, functions. Uh, they're oftentimes associated with the flight feathers so that they make sure they're in the right position. They're also associated with the bill so that they help them in, in foraging. But the feathers you're probably most familiar with are the flight feathers. So these are the very strong but lightweight wing and tail surface feathers that are important for flight. So let's talk about hair. Hair is a synapomorphy for mammals. It also grows from epithelial follicles. In this case, a complete coat of hair is not called the plumage, it's called the pellage. But hair is also uh, filled with keratin and it's dead tissue and it has to be replaced regularly. Now that process of losing one set of hair and then growing another is called shedding. And sometimes there's also variation in color in the different pellages of, of mammals. So here we have a snowshoe hair. Then in the winter, it is white. And in the spring and summer, it is brown. And this allows it to be cryptic uh, with the changing seasons. There are different hair types, just like there are different feather types. Under hair is soft, insulating hair, kind of like down feathers. The guard hairs are coarser, longer, and they provide protection for the animal, for the epidermis in general. They also help to shed water and help keep the under hair uh, from getting wet. And this is the, what you're generally going to see on the outside, so it can form color patterns in the pelage uh, used for communication or crypsis like we showed previously with the snowshoe hairs. They also have whiskers that are concentrated around the head, and these are tactile sensory structures. Of all the tetrapods, mammals have the most diversity in their glands that they use. So they have sweat glands, which are used in evaporative cooling. How evaporative cooling works is you have a wet surface that can absorb heat from the body. And then if wind comes around and evaporates that off, it's drawing that heat away from the body. Doesn't work well in human environments. The presence or absence of sweat glands in different parts of the body varies a lot among ma mammals. So for example, dogs don't have sweat glands over most of their body and that's why they have to pant instead for their evaporative cooling. Scent glands are used for communication of reproductive status, to mark territories, to deter predators. Think about a skunk. Sebaceous glands, these are glands that basically make the body's lotion. I mean, this is what helps keep your skin uh, from getting too dry. It's what makes your hair oily, but makes it where it won't uh, become too brittle. And then the gland that mammals are actually named for, the mammary gland. This is what produces milk for feeding of young, and this is functional only in females. The integument of many tetrapods can be colored in a variety of ways, and it can be very important. 
The color patterns can be due to biochrome pigments in the skin, the scales, hair, or feathers. But in addition to pigments that are actually embedded within these structures, sometimes the structure associated with the integument can cause the certain refraction of certain wavelengths of light and absorption of others to give you kind of these rainbow uh, iridescent colors. Some tetrapods also do have chromatophores that allow them to uh, change their colors. So think about a chameleon. Functions of color in the integument can include camouflage, as we've mentioned, but also the production of courtship displays. So coloration patterns can be more pronounced in the breeding season when males typically are the ones that are more elaborately colored have to convince females to mate with them. And then there's also aposematic coloration and communication seen in some tetrapods. Typically when you see a mammal that's got black and white color patterns, that's a mammal that's trying to convince you that it's dangerous in some way, or it could uh, chemically spray you with something. Think of a skunk. In this case, a badger is a very dangerous animal that you want to stay away from. And this pattern of coloration is oftentimes associated with a threat display. Let's move on to talking about the skeletal system. Um, moving to the terrestrial environment has proved to be a very important selective force. There's a much greater need for more limb support and associated musculature in the terrestrial environment. We also see that there's been the evolution of having separate digits and joints that allow more refined movements in the terrestrial environment. Some of the earliest tetrapods were not the most efficient in moving in the terrestrial environment. They have limbs that kind of just stick out from the side of their body. So this salamander here is a good example of that. And when they walk, the limbs themselves don't do as much movement, but they kind of bend their body like in a swimming-like motion that you'd see in a fish, and they're just kind of slapping down their legs as their body uh, twists. Some amphibians do have more efficient support in locomotion. So frogs, for example, have larger hind limbs that they use for jumping and swimming. And this has also led to some pretty major changes in their skeleton for shorter but more rigid vertebral column to deal with the impact of, of jumping, the powerful muscle contractions associated with that. Mammals have seen a significant rotation of their limbs to a more ventral position underneath the body. This allows the limbs to move more independently without needing to twist the body. So this is a much more efficient system compared to things like the salamanders. The skeletal system of birds has shown a lot of fusion and reduction of bones, including bones of the arms and legs. We're going to see that this is a common theme in birds associated with flight. The complete loss of limbs has evolved independently in several fossorial tetrapods. So think of Sicilians and the amphibians. In the reptiles, we see snakes and legless lizards that have independently lost their appendages. Another skeletal trend seen in tetrapods is a change in the skull to give them greater bite forces. If you look at the ancestral lineages, the amphibians, they have relatively thin skulls, not a lot of musculature, and, and kind of limited bite forces, similar to what we saw in most of the fishes. Amniote skulls, however, have these openings in the temporal region of the skull. These openings allow passage of larger and more complex jaw muscles and this gives them more powerful and refined jaw movements. The anapsid condition represents the ancestral state. An anapsid skull is one that doesn't have holes in the temporal region. Now we do see the anapsid condition also seen in turtles, but this appears to have been a secondary derivation of this condition. The diapsids have two of these holes on each side of the skull. And this is the ancestral reptilian or diapsid condition. In subsequent lineages, one or both of these openings have been secondarily lost or modified significantly. So, uh, for example, in birds, snakes, lizards, and turtles, as I've already mentioned. Lizards and snakes have what are called kinetic skulls. They have very flexible skull joints, and this gives lizards um, even greater bite forces and it allows lizards and snakes greater flexibility in opening their mouths to accommodate and manipulate larger prey, like you can see this snake here. Now moving on to the other branch in this tree, the synapsids, 
have a single pair of these temporal openings, and this is a characteristic seen in mammals today. In addition to the reduction in the size of the bones associated with the leg and the arms of birds, we see that many other bones have been lost or reduced. So if you look specifically at the hand bones, there's been a reduction in fusion of many of these bones. Birds don't have a long bony tail. The tail that you see in birds is really all feathers. And also birds have lost their teeth. All of these are associated with maintaining a lighter body and a stronger body for flight. Another way to make the avian skeleton lighter is to have the larger bones hollow. So th there's a compromise here. You need to make them strong as well for the powers associated with flight. So they have these internal struts for kind of spongy material that still maintains the support but greatly reduces their weight. So in addition to these bony reductions, flight requires certain skeletal reinforcements. So you see there's fusion of thoracic and caudal vertebra. The clavicles have been fused together as well into a, a structure called the furcula. There's overlapping support structures for the ribs to provide a little bit of extra support for the rib cage during the powerful contraction of a, the flight muscles. And then for the attachment of the flight muscles themselves, birds have a large keeled sternum. One of the most important fossils that's ever been found is Archaeopteryx lithographica. This is what we refer to as a transitional fossil because it shows many of the skeletal transitions from the ancient uh, ancestral reptilian non-avian characteristics to the avian characteristics we see in modern birds. So those are highlighted in blue here. If you look at Archaeopteryx, it had separate claws. You don't see separate fingers in modern birds, but this is typical of a reptilian hand. You also see that the bird had teeth. Again, modern birds have lost their teeth. There are other situations associated with the rib cage. We don't see the overlapping support system we just talked about seeing in modern birds. And modern birds don't have a long tail, but Archaeopteryx did. We also see a reduction in the amount of fusion in some of the long bones, like what we see here in the leg. There's much more fusion in modern birds. But the one thing that we do know for sure that makes Archaeopteryx a bird is it had feathers that were identical. The wing and tail feathers are identical in structure to modern wing and tail feathers of birds today. The middle ear bones in tetrapods are homologous with the jaw bones in early vertebrates. Amphibians and reptiles have one middle ear bone, the stapes or columella. This includes birds as well. Mammals, however, have the stapes in two additional middle ear bones, malleus and incus. So with this much more complex skeletal system, we see a much more complex muscular system. Again, the terrestrial environment provides less buoyancy, and so you have to have a stronger skeleton, but you also have to have better muscles for making motion possible. Not only are many of these muscles stronger, but there's more of them for more refined muscular movements. This is particularly true for flight in birds. There's a large breast muscle that's important for providing the power of flapping flight, but there are lots of other muscles, smaller muscles spread throughout the body that give more fine-tuned movement of the wings and other parts of the body. If you are going to fly, they want to concentrate their weight to a very defined center of gravity. They can do this by having a reduction in muscles associated with appendages and simply have long tendons going out to these appendages. And by maintaining most of your big muscles kind of in the core part of your body, it allows you to have a better center of gravity, which makes you more responsive and agile in your flight movements. So in conjunction with the evolution of synapsid and diapsid skulls, we see a much greater complexity and volume of jaw muscles. And this gives most tetrapods much greater bite force capabilities. The transition from aquatic to terrestrial life also required the modification of balance structures. Obviously, if you trip in water, it's not as big of a deal as if you trip on land. So this led to a much more complex inner ear structure for the detection of movements and a greater finesse and orientation and maintenance of balance. For the integration of this information, you also need a larger part of the brain responsible for balance, and this is the cerebellum. 
and the cerebellum is particularly large in birds. It makes up a large fraction of the brain. And this is, again, because of the importance of maintaining subtle cues of balance and orientation during flight. Some of the sensory structures that had to have been modified in the terrestrial environment also required just greater processing of the brain. And so in addition to a larger cerebellum for balance, we have a larger cerebrum for the integration of a lot more sensory information. The sensory structures themselves include chemoreception. Olfaction occurs in the nasal cavities of many animals. Another olfactory receptor is called the Jacobson's organ. So snakes can collect chemicals on their tongue and transport them to the Jacobson organ for detection. The structure is well developed in snakes, uh, but it's absent or vestigial in turtles, crocodilians, and birds, and most marine mammals. Since the smell is really poor in birds, the exceptions of that include kiwis, petrels, vultures, and some waterfowl, they do have well-developed olfactory structures and olfactory bul bulbs in their brain. Amphibians have chemoreceptors spread out across their skin in addition to the, those in the nasal passage. Another form of chemosensory structures in tetrapods are taste buds that can be found in the mouth or tongue. And this is another area where birds just don't really have much. Birds don't have many taste uh, buds, so they likely don't have a good sense of taste. Many tetrapods have very good vision, but this required quite a bit of changes in the eye. Light waves travel differently in aquatic versus terrestrial environments due to the different densities of those media. So this means the eyes had to be modified for different focal lengths. This is accomplished by changing lens shape, the position of the lens, or also by changing the cornea shape. Most lineages can see color. Many mammals can't, but that's kind of the exception. In fact, most birds can see colors that humans can see, plus they can see into the UV spectrum. Several snake lineages uh, also have good color vision, but they can also see into the infrared so that they can detect thermal patterns. The reptiles have large eyes, and these are supported by these bony structures called sclerotic rings. Here you can see them in these skulls, and here you can see one in this section through an eye. The field of vision a tetrapod has depends on its eye location, which in turn generally is associated with a foraging mode. If you're a predator, you want to have forward-facing eyes because this gives you better binocular vision and better depth perception or distance discrimination capacity. If you're a non-predator, you're more likely to be prey and you want to have your eyes on the side of your head because Despite the fact that this may limit your binocular vision, you don't need binocular vision much, but instead you want to have a wider field of view so that you can detect the approach of any predator. It makes it harder for something to sneak up on you. Sound waves also travel differently in aquatic versus terrestrial environments, and so we have to have modifications of the hearing system. We see that there's a tympanic membrane that detects sound in the terrestrial environment in many tetrapods. And then a, a bone or bones of the middle ear, again, this varies between uh, groups, amphibians and reptiles versus mammals, and the number of these middle ear bones. But they amplify these vibrations. These vibrations are detected by sensors in the inner ear, which then converts these into electrochemical signals and sends this information to the brain. Most reptiles and mammals have very good hearing, and they have large auditory lobes for dealing with this sensory information. Now, fossorial lizard snakes have secondarily reduced or lost their tympanic membranes and middle ear cavities. All reptiles lack external ears, so they simply have a surface tympanic membrane or a small hole in the skull that leads to the tympanic membrane. In birds, this hole is actually covered by thin feathers. Here you can see the hole going into the head where the tympanic membrane in this lizard. Toothed whales can focus their echo locating clicks using this melon structure in their head. This focuses the sound at the, their target and then the kickback echo that they get, they're sensing that through their lower jaw and inner ears. Echo location obviously is also seen in the bats. 
So as I mentioned, there's a general pattern of larger brains evolving in, in latter tetrapod lineages. And this is oftentimes associated with the need for greater processing of more sensory information. But they also, in many cases, show greater cognitive abilities. This is particularly true of birds and mammals, in which tool use is commonly seen in many lineages, uh, both the production and the use of tools. They're very good at solving problems, learning complex tasks. So there clearly are some pretty smart birds and mammals out there. Locomotion is highly variable in tetrapods. Most of them can be seen walking, running, and jumping. The earliest forms of this were not very efficient, so salamanders with their more stilt-like limbs that kind of jut out from the side of their body moved more like swimming fish really on land with these sinusoidal twists of the body with not a lot of independent movement of the limbs. Within the amphibians, the frogs and toads have much derived skeletal and muscular morphologies for efficient jumping and swimming with their large hind limbs. Most reptile limbs are better muscularly supported and skeletally supported compared to the amphibians. However, they are still kind of stuck out on the side of their body. But the increased musculature and skeletal mechanisms do allow them to have a little bit more independent and better coordinated uh, movement of the limbs front to back. The mammals, however, have their appendages more ventrally rotated, and this gives them even better coordinated limb movements and more independent limb movements without having to twist the body. Bipedal locomotion has evolved independently a number of times in reptiles and mammals, so this provided in the dinosaurs the potential for wing evolution in birds, and also allowed for grasping hands to evolve in primates. Now, as I mentioned, there are several lineages that have secondarily lost their appendages, and there are several ways that they can move still. So, so one is by using sinusoidal kind of S-shaped body movements with these kind of lateral undulations. Some move using linear movements, so kind of coordinated ventral trunk muscular contractions. So kind of just slowly creeping along. And then one of the more derived forms is this sidewinder movement, where you're just using coordinated contact of very small body regions in a way that kind of just pushes you sideways. A lot of tetrapods can swim, so we've already talked about the large hind limbs and frogs. We see webbed appendages evolving in things like ducks. And we've seen the independent evolution of flippers or fins in different mammal and reptilian lineages. So that includes the penguins, the birds, or again reptiles, whales, seals, for example, because flippers or fins are just a good way to uh, swim. Let's now talk about flight. There are many tetrapods that are capable of gliding for short distances, so they can have skin stretched between forelimbs and hind limbs, like in this flying squirrel or a sugar glider. In some cases, a, a similar membrane can be stretch between ribs that extend from the body as in the draco lizards. Or in some cases, uh, flying frogs have these really massive webbed feet that they use as a gliding surface. But powered flight has evolved very few times in the animal kingdom. We've already talked about one of those this semester, the insects have evolved flight. But the other three times that flight has evolved has been in the tetrapods. So the pterosaurs, are extinct now, but they likely did have powered flight. Some of them may have been primarily limited to gliding flight in windy environments. Bats have very good powered flight using their membranous wings supported by very elongated finger bones. And then flight uh, using feathered wings is what is seen in birds. So let's just talk a little bit about the physics of flight. I'm just going to kind of give you a, a very brief summary of how this works. For a bird to fly, lift has to overcome gravity. Lift can only be created when there is air moving over the wing. And this lift is created by this air movement in two ways. One, air moving over the top of the wings can be deflected downward due to the shape of the wing. And remember, if you're pushing air down, then the wing has to be pushed up. This comes from Newton's third law that says for every action there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. So if the wind is going down, the wing has to go up. 
Another mechanism associated with generating lift has to do with the speed of air moving over the top of the wing versus the bottom of the wing. It's moving much faster over the top of the wing and what this does is it reduces the air pressure on top of the wing surface more than on the bottom. This pressure differential basically creates a vacuum on top of the wing and sucks the wing up. So there we're talking about how we get the bird into the air, but how do you get the bird to move forward? To do that, the bird has to generate enough thrust to overcome drag. Now a gliding bird in windy conditions, what they can do is they just angle their wings forward and downward, and the resultant force that initially was producing lift then turns into forward thrust. And when they do this, though, they're going to be losing lift, and so they're going to lose elevation, until they reorient the wing back into the wind uh, with the wing horizontal to generate more lift. And so you see soaring birds um, gaining altitude and then gliding in the direction they want to go, slowly losing altitude. So those are the basic fundamentals of flight in a gliding bird. But most birds generate these forces of lift and thrust by flapping their wings. To understand that, basically you just have to think about the different parts of the wing functioning differently. So the proximal part of the wings, the part of the wings closest to the body, is generally held more horizontal. So this is where you're going to get most of your lift created. The distal part of the wings during the power stroke is really kind of angled forward. And as it slices through the air, what that does is it generates more thrust. So in review, this is our introduction to the tetrapods, or four-limbed animals. This includes the amphibia, and then the more terrestrially adapted tetrapods, the amniota, which have amniotic eggs, which we'll cover in the next lecture. The amniotes are the mammals and the reptiles, which include birds. They're triploblastic bilateral eucelomate animals, and much of their anatomy and physiology is linked to terrestrial adaptations. So their epithelium is all about reducing the, the abrasion in the terrestrial environment and, and maintaining water, not losing too much water. So they have glands to, that help accomplish this, scales, feathers, hair, and we'll see that feathers and hair are also really important in maintaining temperature in these endotherms. In the terrestrial environment, you don't have the buoyancy of water, so you have to have much more substantial support and locomotion structures. This includes this endoskeleton of bone that's more robust with more joints for more refined movements in the terrestrial environment. Skull modifications include temporal fenestra or holes that allow for the evolution of more robust muscles for production of greater bite forces. And there's a variety of modes of locomotion, walking, crawling, jumping, flying, swimming. Make sure you know that some of the structures associated, the, the modifications of the tetrapod body to make all of these more efficient modes of locomotion, particularly the many modifications that birds have in their skeleton and musculature associated with flight. We just see in general increasing complexity of the tripartite brain in subsequent lineages of tetrapods. This includes a much larger cerebellum for the challenges of balance in the terrestrial environment a greater cerebrum for a greater integration of sensory information and also for greater cognitive abilities that we see in many of the tetrapods, particularly the birds and the mammals. And then make sure you understand what sense organs they have and how these have been modified for better functionality in the terrestrial habitat compared to the aquatic habitat.